Um, so uh, welcome to practice. It's going to be a great time. We're really, really happy to have you here. Um, a room full of smart people that uh, are here to think about game design. Before I introduce Holly, just one announcement. There are slots available for the open problem session that's happening at the end of the day tomorrow. So a lot of you are signed up to present, but we could still squeeze in a few more. That's a session where, with slides, without slides, people present a problem they're working on, maybe a prototype, an idea, something they're stuck with, and they want to use the wisdom of the crowd. It's very short. You usually present for about a minute and get about two or three minutes of feedback, and then we're on to the next one. If you've been here before, it's a really exciting session. But if you have something that you would like to present about, share a work in progress, an idea in progress, and get feedback on it for a very concrete problem or question that you want to ask the audience, uh, please just come to me uh, during the reception, and, and we'll sign you up. So it's really my pleasure tonight to open up the practice conference with this talk by Holly Gramazio. Holly is an amazing designer, and I think that I can say, I'm going to say it here first. Holly is the Christo of game design. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know Christo, Christo is an artist who's been working for many decades. Actually, Christo and John Paul, right, uh, his partner. Um, is it John Paul? John Claude. Yes? Someone help me. If only we had access to a wireless internet, uh, wireless information source that could, someone's going to shout it out. Christo and... Jean-Claude, thank you. Christo and Jean-Claude, who create temporary works of art, m uh, grand, massive, monumental works. If you remember the Gates Project in Central Park, where, where they created these colorful temporary gates. Sometimes they shroud buildings in a color, or, or the very famous work that was a very, very long wall that wound its way, fabric wall that wound its way through, through a long stretch of California. Well, what's that? Uh, running, running Fence, I think it was called. So. Um, as Frank said, games can help us see the world in new ways. And, and Christo's work does that. It's something which, which reframes our experience of the world. And Holly, as a game designer, has dedicated her life to doing that through play. And I've played many of Holly's games. And many of them are site-specific, and some of them are behavior-specific. In playing Holly's game, you might find yourself uh, seeing a little corner of a city in a very particular way. You might find yourself singing karaoke uh, competitively. Uh, you, might, you might find yourself whispering uh, secrets in a, in a narrative game about, about love and, um, and, and uh, hidden desires. Um, and through these activities, um, your, your behavior becomes something that, um, uh, that, that you think about, reflect on, and playfully transforms into an activity that, that gives you a new perspective on the world. Um, and I think that there's, there's, for me, there's nothing greater than uh, a game designer who doesn't see at play and game design as just something which is about creating artificial context, but sees play and games as something which can help transform our understanding of the world, our understanding of ourselves, and our relationships with each other. And, um, and uh, I, I'm thrilled here to, to introduce Holly. She's going to talk about her work, and then she's going to actually uh, host a game or two at the reception uh, that uh, sort of uh, carries forward some of the ideas that she's going to talk about here today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Holly Gramazio, the Christo and John claude of Game Design. Sorry, I've just lost the mouse on the other screen. I can see it. Now what side am I? Aha! Got it! <laughs> Amazing. Right. Hello. Um, like Eric said, I'm Holly. I'm a game designer and I make games that are kind of annoying to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Previously I was lead game designer at a company called Hide and Seek, which some of you may know about. And while I was there I led on games like the New Year Games, which was a thing we did in Edinburgh on the 1st of January in 2012. The idea is that everyone goes up to Edinburgh to watch fireworks on the 31st, and then on the 1st of January, they can't leave because the trains don't run. And so there's thousands of people stuck wandering around, and every year the council puts on something else. And in, in 2012, it was us. It was us running a street game for around 12,000 people around the streets of Edinburgh and in the cathedrals and in the museums. 
And, and I did things like curate the Hide and Seek Weekender, which is a festival that ran at the South Bank Centre. It has, you know, pervasive games and street games and things made by people who identify as artists in other fields but want to experiment with game design, kind of London's equivalent of, of come out and play. And from the beginning of this year, I've been working independently, doing more or less the same sorts of things I used to do. I'm going to give examples of a few of the things that I've been working on this year, just to give a kind of context. And then I'm going to talk a bit more about this form of games in general. So just briefly, this is a game I made for a festival in, in Poland called Play Public. This is a game called Hotel Room. And the idea with this is you come to a room in a hotel, a, a physical room in a hotel called Hotel Logos, and step in and there's a, a hotel room, an immaculate little hotel room, perfect and untouched the way hotel rooms always are when you go into them, except with a computer on the table and a, a description on the computer of the room that you're in. Just a little twine game telling you about the room and about the people who've been in there before and you start playing through it and it sends you into different parts of the room, gives you little games to play and tasks to do, then a way of sending you back to the computer, moving between the two different versions of the room before you get kicked out about 20 minutes later. And a game that's running at the moment, or a series of games that's running at the moment in a lot of little towns around East Durham, which is a very uh, windswept and cold and intermittently rainy part of the east coast of England. And the idea was this, with this was that we were given six different locations in different towns across East Durham and designed little site-specific games for each one that caused you to play with and interact with the spaces in different ways. And we painted the rules down and then went away and hoped that people would stumble across them and give them a go. Did things like Karyo Cards with Stee Curran, which is a card game that you play during a karaoke session, tries to make you less nervous if you're nervous about karaoke by giving you the cards to blame for being terrible. <laughs> and, and if you're really good at karaoke, it helps to try to prompt you to try new things. It doesn't give you songs to d try, but it says things like, artist beginning with B, or, oh my god, I was a teenager, or I would marry this artist. And then you combine those to come up with the songs you want to sing. And Nowhere I'd Rather Be, which was for another festival in Copenhagen, which is a kind of competitive crafting game of dueling visions of utopias for Copenhagen's future, as manifested in shoeboxes bought from Ikea for £1.25 each. <laughs> so stuff like this, right? Stuff where physicality matters and our bodies matter, and things that are designed for a particular location or a particular type of location. It's things where when I explain it to people, they usually, well, often end up saying, oh, you mean for children, or oh, you mean for team building, because those are the sorts of ways they can understand. They can understand people playing in the world if it's enforced at work, or if it's kids. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I do things for kids, I don't do things for team building. But the idea of adults physically playing in, in the world in specific types of players, places is really, really long. It goes back a long way. In the distant past, you get all sorts of ridiculous things. This is um, a picture of late 16th century attempt to recreate the Olympic Games in a village in the Cotswolds, except they didn't do like traditional ancient Greek-style Olympic things. They did throwing stuff at each other and peculiar wrestling and balancing on your head competitions. <laughs> And when you get to the Victorians, as far as I can tell, in the 19th century, no one did anything with their leisure time except gather in rooms, in parlours, hence parlour games, and play these ridiculous games, which I could go on about for, for about an hour and a half. I won't, but I do want to give a couple of my favourite examples. There's a game that the Victorians used to play called Are You There, Moriarty? And the way this works is that two players are blindfolded. They both lie on the ground... One of them is given a rolled up newspaper, the other person says, are you there, Moriarty? And the person with the newspaper tries to bash the person who said, are you there, Moriarty? All in massive Victorian dresses. <laughs> <laughs> There's another game called Poor Pussy, and the way that works is one person is nominated to be the cat. And they crawl around the room, again, in like very stiff suits or enormous dresses, and they go up to people and mew. And then the people they mew at have to pat them on the head and say, poor pussy, poor pussy. 
And if they laugh while they do this, the, it's their turn to be the poor pussy. <laughs> and at the end, at the end of a load of people playing these games, what they would do is have forfeit. So every time you lost, you had to give up an item that you owned. And then to get the item back, you would have to pay a forfeit, which might be something like... Um, kiss every corner of the room, except people would then go and stand in the corner of the room and, and look smug. Like there's, <laughs> there, there's this whole culture of play that's about 70% people's human desire to play and 30% people's human desire to have an excuse to kiss each other in a socially acceptable way. So there's a big lineage of games with a physical presence, games for particular types of location. But it is kind of new, I guess, as as a job, as a thing that, that people do. There haven't been people doing it for all of that long, that long and then having to explain it at parties. So what I'm going to do now is talk a bit about the sorts of games that people always design when they start doing this kind of thing. Um, there are games that I've designed different versions of. There are games that almost everyone who starts dabbling in pervasive game design will end up doing some version of. And I'm going to use those basic mechanics that people keep returning to and returning to to talk about some of the problems that you have to deal with in designing this kind of game. And then I'm going to look through the problems and talk about some of the tricks that people have developed to try to do deal with these. So these are types of games, I guess, that if we were a well-established enough field to have genres, we'd call our genres. And they don't really have proper names. Um, I refer to them as the games where you hide a thing and people write clues about it. The games where you put blindfolds on people and that one of them is trying to do a thing and the other person is yelling at them about how to do it. And a game where you're hiding and trying to take photos of other people, but they're also trying to take photos of you. Um, I'm really, really bad at names. So if anyone would care to come up with catchy suggestions for these that make sense, that would be wonderful. Firstly, the games where you hide a thing and give people clues to find the thing. It feels like this must be really old. It feels like it must be a basic game type, a thing that people have done since forever. But it only really kicks off in the Victorian era. And my very, very favourite example of it comes in the early 20th century. This is a thing that nowadays we refer to as the Treasure Hunt Riots. At the time, it probably had some sort of big early 20th century name like the uh, thrilling and exciting treasure hunt whereby you were given clues to the locations of medallions throughout the great city of London. But the fact that we now call it the treasure hunt riots gives you some idea of how it turned out. <laughs> the way it worked was that a newspaper called the Weekly Dispatch made a load of medallions that said on them think things like, um, you may redeem this for £50 if you were presented at the offices of the Weekly Dispatch. And then in the weekly dispatch, they printed clues about where these medallions were hidden. And they didn't want it to be too easy, so the clues were kind of vague. They were things like, if you follow upon the green fence and turn to your left and see a cragged tree, then walk onto the next crossroads and turn right. Or, um, it is beyond the green stile. Or, down by the river at low tide. Are there a lot of green fences in London? There's a lot of river. The Thames is really long. And so, obviously, when people looked for this, they normally looked for them in the wrong places. They looked for them in the streets. They looked for them in their own backyards, in fields. They looked for them in other people's backyards. They got kicked out of other people's backyards and then came back with lanterns and dug in the dark. Um, the police started to crack down on people whom they thought might be searching for these medallions. There's a story of one guy who'd found one, just dug it up. Policemen wandered along and he had to drop it, cover it and the hole that he'd dug it out of with his foot and have this sort of cordial conversation for 15 minutes where he went, why, yes, all of these people digging up medallions everywhere. Isn't, isn't it a fright? <laughs> And then 20 years later, something kind of similar happened. Again, a newspaper in England with a sort of a publicity stunt. They hadn't really learned. This is a thing called Lobby Ludd. And the way Lobby Ludd works is the um, Westminster Gazette, I think the newspaper was this time, hired an actor to wear a hat and a pipe to play the character of Lobby Ludd. And Lobby Ludd would go to a different seaside town, usually, every week. And then there'd be some kind of vague clues about where Lobby Ludd was going to be and what Lobby Ludd was going to be doing, printed in the Westminster Gazette. 
And if you found Lobby Ludd with a copy of the Westminster Gazette in your hand, obviously, and said to him, you are Lobby Ludd, then you would win £5, £10, £50 at compounded. The longer he went unfound, the more you would win. And again, it got really, really out of hand. They had to put on special trains to the, to the stations and the towns where people thought Lobby Ludd was going to be wandering around because so many people wanted to play. This is a picture of Richmond Park where 50,000 people turned up to try to find Lobby Ludd and failed. There's <laughs> stories of guys who looked a bit like Lobby Ludd getting trapped in phone boxes while people surround them going, Lobby Ludd, I claim my money, you are Lobby Ludd. Them just pitifully yelling, it's not me, it's not me. Um, it's amazing. Like, this is super popular, right? And you get this basic mechanic, you know, there are some cryptic clues, you want to find a thing, the thing is worth some money, so people kind of care about it more. In loads of things since then, in Kit Williams' Masquerade, and a ton of args and a ton of puzzle hunts. It's sort of the go-to mechanic for people who don't really think of themselves as game designers, who want to make a big city-wide game. And it actually works super well, right? Um, normally when I tell people we had 12,000 players for the New Year games, they go, wow, that's a lot. But Lobby Ludd had up to 250,000 players in a single week with a guy in a hat and a pipe as their only production costs. It's extraordinary, but there are problems that, that you can see arising from it, right? The players aren't in your control. You send them out, and then you can't tell them not to do what they're doing. They've often, they'll often misunderstand what you want, and they get super, super invested in problematic ways. And I'm going to come back to these problems after I finish going through a couple more mechanics. The next mechanic I want to talk about are games where one person is blindfolded, and somebody is giving them instructions while they try to accomplish a task, which is a kind of clumsy description, but it's used over and over again. I think I've designed about four games that essentially do this. When I was curating the Sandpit, which was a monthly event for people to try out new games, someone would send me one or two of these a month. And often they're lovely. I'm going to talk about my two very favourite ones of these rather than all of the ones that are very similar to each other. There's a lot where you're trying to build a card house while you're blindfolded or make your way through a cardboard maze. But there are some that have particular characteristics that I think are really interesting. This is a game called Dreadnought by a designer called Spot of. Technically, this is part of the New Year Games, but Spot of came to the New Year Games as one of the local artists who designed games for places around Edinburgh with a very, very, very firm idea of what she wanted. The only support we really gave her was production support, so I had more or less no input in this, and I feel okay, therefore, saying that it's one of my favourite games of this type. There are these people with big conical hats that cover their whole head. They are wandering around these little columns, which are very easy to knock over, and they're trying to pick up some metal springs which are scattered all the way around. They're being guided by the people standing on the pedestals all the way around who are talking to a microphone which is broadcasting into a little speaker inside the hats. The voices are also coming out through speakers all along so that people who are watching can listen. And it's really, really pretty, right? It runs for about seven minutes. People walk around quite awkwardly. They knock things over. They pick things up. They begin to get the hang of it and move more fluidly. And then it's over. Changeover took a long, long time. So these hats are kind of made of folded sculptural paper and getting seven or eight people off of the court, getting these delicate paper things off of them, getting those onto the next people while someone resets all of the columns and puts a spring back, took almost as long to do as it took the game to run. Um, wasn't always clear to people who are watching what's going on. So the symbols are purely aesthetic, but people watching it wanted to read something in them, wanted to understand what the different roles were. Uh, there are some two-headed, not two-headed, the opposite of two-headed, single-headed, two-bodied, I guess, monsters, where you have two people with their heads in a single thing. And again, people were broadly unclear as to whether that was mechanically identical or not when they were just watching. So it wasn't always possible to, for people to figure out what was happening, which meant that they'd watch for a few minutes and then wander on because they couldn't get invested in the outcome. And like, this is a really tediously practical issue, but 
when things are hard to when things are far away, it can be quite hard to see them. So there's these little springs on the ground. We've got this long, narrow playing field. People standing at either end, and once you send your your controlee over to the other side, you can't really see what's going on. They'll, you'll be, they'll be banging into things all over the place. And there's kind of some strategic interest there, right? Do you risk sending them further in order to get a spring when you know that you're going to be able to control them less precisely? But it's also sometimes just a bit annoying. And because you can't see at all, and because there's so many things around you that you can knock over, and because the instructions are so precise, as someone who has a cone around their head, you can sometimes feel slightly disempowered. And as an instructor, you can sometimes feel overly responsible. If they knock something over, it's your fault, you feel bad, you ruined it for them. It was still lovely, it was still a lot of fun, it was still gorgeous to watch, but these are some of the problems that came up with it. And this is my, I think, very favourite game of this type. I think that's me in the background. I didn't notice that when I was putting this together. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game by a designer called Jacob Lecoeur, possibly Jacob Lecoeur. It's called Avatar Controller. It's part of a series of games he's made around this theme. And the way it works is there's a low hedge maze. In the low hedge maze, there are three avatars. These are players who have been given these white suits and these folded lampshades over their heads so they can't see. Um, outside, there are controllers who have a little iPad with buttons on it that just say, go left, go, turn left, turn right, forward, back, duck, throw. And there's also a ball in the hedge maze. You have to find the ball and throw it at another avatar. If you're hit, you're out. It's all very, very simple, but it's absolutely gorgeous in the way it works. Um, it deals with the problem of not being able to see things that are far away by having platforms all the way around, which players who are controlling avatars can run around and step on and step off of. So you have this frantic physical element, even for the people who are, who are controlling, who normally wouldn't have much to do with their bodies. Um, the control mechanism is really imprecise, which means that the avatar has some degree of autonomy. They can follow the instructions well or poorly. They can use their own judgment just a little bit. It also means they move quite slowly because they don't really know what's going on, which increases their strangeness and the peculiarity of what you're, you're watching. Um, it's they all look the same, which is actually really cool, because when one of them's out, you just transfer your loyalties to another. You can't even really keep track of who is who. So whoever the person who wins is, if you're uh, an audience member, if you're watching it, you're going to feel triumphant and applaud them. <laughs> and for the avatars, being inside these lampshades is super interesting. You're not quite blindfolded. You can see these green and pink geometric patterns. You can see bits of light and shade. It helps you feel like you aren't your normal self. You're not just you with a blindfold on. You're, you're you being controlled. You're you in a different world. The changeover is still tricky. The changeover is still kind of time consuming. But I think this is, this is a really lovely game that I like a lot. And so the problems that come up in this game that you can see recurring over and over again are things about asymmetry being tricky. If you have people with different roles within the game, then people can resent the role that they've got, they can feel disempowered or they can feel like they've got too much responsibility. You get things where it takes ages to do anything because you're worried about physical objects breaking. Worse, you get occasions where physical objects actually do break. One of the white suits that Jakob gave people did get torn. Luckily, he had a spare. And, and the very, very practical obvious thing of it's hard to see far away things. So I've got one more mechanic that I'd like to go into before I get into these problems in a bit more detail. This is a game where you have to take a picture of someone else while trying to avoid having a picture taken of you. And this is, I would say, even more prevalent in events where pervasive games happen than any of the other two mechanics. Uh, the first time I encountered it was a game called Luminatio by a designer called Chrysic Baliki. And it's a game where there are around 60 players with swimming caps on their head and numbers written on the back of the swimming caps. You try and take photos of other people's numbers. If you get someone else's number and they don't get you, you get a point. And you can see in this photo already one of the problems with that, because that's not a swimming cap. That's a carefully folded piece of newspaper, because it turns out swimming caps worn not in the water for an hour are really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, this game also took about two hours to score at the end. 
because like, you can't just add up the number of times someone's taken a photo, right? Because if you do that, then any two people are advantaged by reaching an accord where they just take a photo of each other. So people would cheat and collude and, and make deals, and that's not what the game is about. So you only get the point if you take a photo of someone who doesn't have a photo of you, which means for every player, for 60 players, you have to cross-reference against every other player to see who has a who has a unidirectional photo. And it takes a really long time. And also people get super enthusiastic. You can see that this game is being run by, by a road. Um, I would bet that players are not permitted to cross that road because if they were, there would be problems. And there are just so many games like this. I, I once got an email from someone who wanted to run a game at the Weekender, which said that he had designed this game with three or four of his friends, but he said that it could only run in the Holocaust Memorial. Uh, he said that he knew there wasn't a Holocaust Memorial at the South Bank Centre, but he thought we could recreate it using cardboard. Um, we didn't do that. We also didn't do almost all of the other versions of this game that we were sent over the years. Uh, the worst version of it that I've ever encountered, though, was at uh, a stag do that I was at. I mean, the fact that I was at a stag do means it was already slightly untraditional. What's a stag do? A st uh, what do you do? What do you call it? Bachelor party. Bachelor party. Um, uh, another way in which it was untraditional was that um, in the afternoon we all went and took part in a pervasive game that someone was running. Um, someone was running this commercially, not one of my friends, so I feel okay about being mean about it. It was a photo hunt. It was a really terrible photo hunt where you had to go and get photos of lots of different things. I, one of the things was a man in a dress. I was, I was one of two women at the party. I was the only one with a dress. So I had to spend 10 minutes like, sitting in the loo, checking Twitter while I'd given my dress to other members of my team so they could go and photograph themselves in it. It was a really terrible game. But one of the things that you could get points for, one of the things in the photo hunt, was photos of the other team not looking at you. And that did make it better. This was the sole element of tension in the whole thing. It also made it much, much worse in a way because it wasn't that unpredictable and untraditional a bachelor party. Everyone was quite drunk and telling people to sneak around and dash across roads and hide when everyone's quite drunk is a really, really, really bad idea. So this was an addition to the mechanics that made it better and also far more dangerous. And finally, this is a game called Scoop, which is a game I worked on at Hide and Seek with Alex Fleetwood, our director. And this is a game about rival news teams filming stories. We give them stories that they need to try to locate and film. And one of the stories that they can report on is the shoddy reporting of another news team. <laughs> And we tried to deal with some of the problems that you get in this kind of thing. So, for example, scoring at the end, we gave people cameras that were running constantly, and then at the end, we played the videos on three screens simultaneously and did the scoring live every time someone came through a story. And when we fixed that, we just came across a whole other crop of problems, like... Sometimes people in a team would say, oh, I'm going off to scout to other members of their team. And then they would leave, and then they would take their tie off so they couldn't be identified as members of their team. They would cheat and scurry around, then put their tie back on and go back to their team. We had a lot of cheating with this game, and we never fully resolved that. So this sort of game shows up problems like adding up scores in the real world is super, super tedious. Like if people do things physically and then bring back the evidence of that and you have to deal with it, it's really boring. Um, lots of people cheat as soon as they're given the opportunity. And finally, cars are real and can hurt you. And I think all of these different problems kind of fall into a couple of different categories. One of them is people have bodies, and that can be really annoying. And the other is the rules for this sort of game only exist within people's brain and within their explicit agreement to maintain the rules. And that can also occasionally be really annoying. So I'm going to go through the different elements of these in a little bit more detail and talk about the different ways some games have dealt with them. Problems around people having bodies. So... Things where we can only see and hear stuff near us, that's got a couple of really obvious solutions and not much else. Either you let people move or you use tech to bring the distant sounds and the distant vision to them. And so usually when a game encounters this problem, it's reasonably soluble. Um, bodies have different capabilities. That one can be really awkward. 
Uh, if you get 40 people together and get them to run out and do things, then some people are going to be much, much better at running than other people. Some people are going to be much, much better at jumping. And it's obvious to everyone that that's the case in a way that isn't necessarily the case when you're playing more privately oriented games. So people feel self-conscious about it. And people tend to resolve that by having lots of different ways to win or lots of different routes to accomplish things or just being really, really clear at the start about what's involved so that no one feels obliged to do it, which is part of the reason I don't make games for team building, because they're, they're mandatory, right? It's much, much harder to make an experience good when people feel like they have to do it. Um, bodies are fragile is kind of the big one. Lots of the very, very best games are super dangerous. <laughs> There's a game that's played in lots and lots of different towns historically around England and Scotland called something like the ball game or village football. And the way this game works, historically, it doesn't get played so much nowadays, is everyone in the village is playing. You divide into two teams, maybe the people who live on the east of the river and the people who live on the west of the river, and you have one ball and then you have a goal, maybe a mile out of the village one way and another goal a mile out of the village the other way. And for a whole day, everyone's just trying to get the ball to their goal one time. The first team to do that wins. There's a story about a village near Derby where this happened. And one of the games, was, one of the goals was a fence post way out a mile in one direction. And the other was a water mill at the top of a river. And when the game started, one of the, team, one of the members of the team that was aiming for the water mill grabbed the ball and jumped in the river, and he was the strongest swimmer in the river, so everyone knew there was nothing they could really do about it. They didn't want to jump into the water and grapple the ball from him and, you know, potentially drown. So what they did instead was they ran up the river to the water mill and set the water mill churning away <laughs> so that he would not be able to swim up the river and reach it and then just lined the river along it. Like laughing at him and waiting for him to get too tired and give up. And these games got played for dozens, hundreds of years sometimes because they're great and simple and easy to pass on. They're lovely, but they are really, really, really dangerous. <laughs> there are a few ways you can try to get people to not risk their lives in pursuit of an extra point or two. For example, um, saying you cannot not saying you cannot do this but saying you cannot do this and if you do you are out of the game um, if you just tell people not to like if you tell people they might die then that doesn't really bother them but if you tell them they might be disqualified then that's the thing that they care about <laughs> um, it's also designing games that don't reward that kind of putting yourself into danger as much as possible. But there are some games where you just can't avoid it, right? You cannot design a version of that village football game where putting yourself into danger will not be rewarded. So often, really annoyingly, and I'm hoping that, you know, over the next 20 years of this type of game, someone will come up with some better solutions. Often the solution is just don't run them. They're wonderful games, and when people come up with them themselves and run them themselves, that's great. But if you, as a designer, are standing there telling them to do it, then it becomes a problem. And finally, we have the issues of non-players also being in places where you're trying to run games and having bodies and feelings and sometimes disapproving, which, to be fair, sometimes there are designers who like and who one of the things they value about this type of game is transgressing usual use of public space and making people who are passing by a bit irritated about it. I'm basically a coward, so I like it when everyone's happy and looks at things and go, oh, isn't that nice? So I don't like running that sort of game myself, but there are a lot of excellent designers who do. So there are things that you can do around this, like trying to make it clear that it's an event, preferably an arts event. If you can have colourful hats on people that aren't party hats but look sort of magnificent, then that will help a lot. Balloons will help a lot. Like 10% of all pervasive game design problems can be solved with balloons. Um, <laughs> Making it so that people can understand what's going on, whether that's through signage or through design, is really helpful as well, especially if you're trying to lure them in. So one of the games that does this best, I think, is by a, a guy called George Buckingham called 
Punch the Custard, which again, a few of you probably know. Yes, Punch the Custard is a lovely game. I'll just describe it quickly for anyone who doesn't. If you punch custard, your fist doesn't go in because it's weird. Um, <laughs> so this is a game where you compete to see who can punch a bowl of custard the most times in a minute. The computer logs each time you do it. And people wander by and where normally if they saw someone running a game would look faintly irritated, stop and go, what's going on? And then get the idea within about 10 seconds because what else is go possibly going on when you see two people frantically punching a bowl of custard? And then in huge numbers, more than I've seen with pretty much any other pervasive game, they join the end of the queue to have a go. So one, some, one of the things that you can do is just use this as a way to, to get more players in. So having short rounds of things that run very often and are comprehensible to outsiders is something that gets done a lot. The other problem is rules being kept in brains, which is kind of a trickier one. With video games and to some extent board games, you can enforce the rules of the game through the game world itself, right? There are plenty of video games that you cannot meaningfully cheat in because anything that you're permitted to do within the world is a, a valid thing. In, the, in this sort of game, we're asking the players to agree to constrain themselves to a subset of the actions available to them in order to accomplish a certain aim. And to do that, people have to understand the constraints and understand the aim really well. And then they also have to agree to it and not try to cheat, which is it's a very delicate web to keep suspended. And it can get super awkward, especially if you're not physically there watching them. When it's all within one space and you're there, it's much easier. So people do things like explain many times in many different ways, each of them taking no more than about two minutes. So um, Catherine Herdlich and Gabe Smedrisman, who run Come Out and Play in San Francisco, are super good at this. Whenever they run a game, they both give you a verbal explanation while they're wearing some sort of costume to make you pay attention to them. And then they give you an A5 sheet of paper where they've also managed to squeeze the rules on somehow to quite complex games. Tiny, tiny little A5 sheet of paper. Um, sometimes people don't want to play because it sounds dumb, and that's kind of okay. People have to be able to choose not to play, but sometimes you know they will like it if you can just get them into it. So you can sort of use social force to get them through the initial reluctance. So this is another reason why people wear costumes to explain games or stand on a bench or have a handout. It gives you a sort of authority to go, it's okay. And as long as people know that they can leave the game after it's been going for a minute or two if they don't want to, it can be, make it a lot easier to win them in to give it a go and, and hopefully try. You can get people to try really, really, really dumb sounding things if you just explain it with enough confidence. I tried this out once by designing a game called The Lizard's Tale, which is a game in which you're all lizards and you've written stories about being lizards, the lizard's tail, you see. But the ends of the stories are written on sheets of fabric which are chucked into a belt, the lizard's tail, because it's a double meaning and you have to try to steal the tails from other lizards to make the best ending to your story. And it's the dumbest premise for a game I could come up with. And once people had got through the three minutes where they didn't really think it was going to work and thought it sounded dumb, but because I was looking at them and being very enthusiastic, they were too polite to say, this is dumb, we're not doing it. <laughs> once they then got out and played, everyone finished the game. And then at the end of it, some other people wanted to have a go. So you can sort of try to enforce fun as long as you give people an out if they, don't, if they really don't want to do it. Just have to never waver and have some sort of thing to make you sound official. Um, people have ideas is another problem. Um, because these r rules are enforced by our agreement, sometimes people go, what if we try it like this? Which can be great, but often isn't. And either way, if you've started, it's kind of too late because everyone's already got the rules into their head. So again, for this, it's just a matter of never wavering and having something looking official and saying, oh, we can try that out afterwards if anyone wants to have another go. And finally, people cheat. People cheat really, really a lot. Not everyone, but a lot of people. Some, most people cheat to win. Some people cheat, cheat to lose because they feel bad about winning. And, you know, I was saying earlier about giving in-game penalties for uh, people risking their lives. You cannot do this for cheating because people will then begin to see it as a, a choice that they're validly making within game. If you say, if we catch you doing this, then we're taking one of the ribbons away. Or if we catch you doing this, you're out of the game. They go, oh, OK, so it's within the game world that I can choose to risk this form of cheating. And if I don't get caught, well done, mate. So 
giving in-game penalties for cheating just makes things worse. So try things like um, setting up the game so that you can't cheat except with collusion. So, for example, I talked about Scoop earlier, where people would go off from their team and take the tie off to cheat. They didn't do it in front of their team because they didn't want to say to the rest of their team, you know what, I'm going to cheat now. I think it's a good idea. Are we all on board with cheating? So if you keep people in groups, then that helps. It's watching what's going on. It's not necessarily saying there will be a penalty, but saying we are watching to make sure no one cheats. Uh, lying about watching, saying, oh, we've got monitors around. And also, if you can't do anything else, making it so that if people cheat, no one else notices. Because the thing that cheating really ruins is other people's enjoyment of the game when they see it happening. There's nothing more frustrating in this sort of context than seeing someone else cheat and not really being able to do anything about it. So if you get to the point where someone's going to cheat and you can't do anything about it, you can just make it possible for them to do that without anyone else noticing. And usually, in like sort of quite pleasing poetic justice, it turns out that they've put so much time into thinking about how to cheat that they lose anyway. Um, I'm not sure how long I've been going for because the timer here um, started. Uh, oh, okay. Where are you in your talk? Um, I've got like another ten-ish minutes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to briefly now, just to finish off, talk about these problems in relation to a couple of the games that I mentioned earlier. So games of places and hotel rooms, and how these different difficulties occurred in it. Um, so for Games of Places, we had a load of different locations suggested by our producers, former, who were lovely. They varied a lot. We had parks, we had community centres, we had this sort of weird bridge that was also a sculpture that was built in the 60s. And we went up for site visits and looked around, and different problems started coming up based around these issues of, of physicality. So, for example, this is a game called Balioki that we ran at Shotton Community Centre. This is um, Ivan, who worked on the project with me, testing it out. The way you play is you choose a song, you balance on this bar, you try to sing or rap your way as far through the song as you can before you fall off. It's very simple. We had some games here we were really happy with, and then the people at the centre warned us that if a thing around the community centre could be taken, it would be. If we put something on the ground, if we put a sign anywhere, it would get taken. This was a community centre where a special no-tamper playground with the screws hidden behind little curved bits of plastic got taken as a challenge and was partially dismantled within half an hour. It's a community centre where someone burnt down a metal picnic table. <laughs> When I was at Hide and Seek, I worked on a similar project, which again, some of you know, might know about, called 99 Tiny Games. And for that, we put the games on stickers and we stuck them on the ground. And most of the stickers lasted for the month they were in place. This was clearly not going to work here. So paint, right? Painting things on the ground. But paint needs big letters. You, you need your letters about this big if you're painting them on the ground and want someone to be able to see them from standing. So getting the rules across it became very key that we try to squish them into as little space as possible. This is a game called Steps and Ladders. The way you play this is you stand at the end of the path, you both call out a number simultaneously, and then you both move the number of squares along the path that you called out, unless one of you called a number that is more than two bigger than the other person's number, in which case you don't get to move at all while they do. So it's sort of bluffing and trying not to be greedy and racing. And it's, it's neat. It's, it works really well on this path, but it's kind of awkward to explain, especially when you know you're not going to be there to tell anyone, they're just going to stumble across it. And when you're painting, it gets really, really, really key to get into as few words as possible. So you had these constraints on how we could express the rules verbally. Um, but at the same time, the paint enabled new things in the game. So here is the start of a pathway at the community center. And we were talking about it and went, it would be great if we could have some arrows on these and have a game where basically you just have to get across it, but you can only step on the ones with arrows. And you always have to point your foot in the direction of it. So it sort of becomes this twistery, dancey thing. And then once we knew that we were using paint, we were able to do this. So it did open up new possibilities. Once we were painting on the ground, though, we also got the issue of it looks a bit like graffiti. And so in order to resolve that, to make sure that other people wouldn't be sad when they saw it, 
We had to make it more clearly intentional, more clearly something that was meant to be there, and more clearly something temporary. So we came up with, in the parks, for example, games that used leaves that we also painted on the ground. So we painted 40 or 50 leaves in different colours across the park and used those in the games, like some running and chasing and standing on them, some like barely even games, things where you're walking your dog and you get a point every time your dog goes over a leaf, unless it goes over a yellow leaf. If that happens, you lose. <laughs> Also did some really annoying placement of the yellow leaves near trees that we could tell dogs were interested in. <laughs> and we did things like writing how to play and giving each game a title, because again, that would help people who encountered it to know it was, it was a thing, it was meant, they were part of a connected body of work. And we also made it clear that it was temporary, partly through using autumn leaves. No one's going to paint autumn leaves in a way that's meant to be there all year round, right? So people would stumble across it and sort of instinctively know that they didn't have to worry about this being a new thing in their park forever. Then we had problems of what sort of paint. Right? It had to be removable, it had to be not water-based, but it had to be chemically removable with something that was ecologically sound, wasn't too expensive, that dried fast. And it also had to go on this, which is the Apollo Pavilion, which is a grade two star listed building, which puts it in the 10% most protected of the special protected old buildings in England, and which is itself located within a grade two listed park. It's really nerve wracking to get some paint that you're pretty sure is removable <laughs> and then slather it onto a grade two star listed building in front of the people who look after it, going, yeah, we have to let it dry for 15 minutes and then it will definitely come off. We promise. <laughs> so there's issues around that, but we did find something that you could do. This in particular was a really great space to use. It's amazing for play, obviously. Lots of kids play here already, and they're the only people who really use it. So we left off the how to play in the game titles here because we knew there wouldn't be adult stimuli and cross it needing things explained, and we thought the kids who were mostly sort of 12, 13 might find it overly kiddy. But the games that they play are terrifying. <laughs> Uh, they came up and talked to us a lot while we were designing games there and told us about the games that they played, which were mostly about climbing over the top, except for one which was about bringing the sofa cushions from their nearby house and putting that in a big pile at the bottom of the pavilion and then jumping off onto it. <laughs> it was terrifying, and we had some games that, and that we realised once we had playtested them with these kids didn't tell people to climb, but would be used like that. They would just clamber over things. And again, it's the issue of if people want to do this on their own, then that's kind of fine, right? That the jumping off of the pavilion game is clearly great, but it's not okay for us to encourage them to do so. Finally got to the physical installation and again got more problems with physicality. So for example, painting them on. This is the artist Hannah Sibai that I worked with on this. She is trying to use a spray paint gun to spray through the stencil. About two minutes into our very first location, it broke. We phoned the hardware shop we'd got it from and said, hey, can we return this and get a new one quite urgently? It's broken. And they said, oh, no, it's been recalled because it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out there are no other battery-operated handheld paint sprayers that you could put paint of our consistency into beyond, you know, 800 pound a day to hire huge mechanical things. And uh, sadly, we don't have Christian and Jean-Claude's budgets. <laughs> so we decided to try paintbrushes, but paintbrushes didn't work either because paintbrushes carry too much paint, so it slides under the stencils. So in the end, we used cotton buds because cotton buds use, they carry very, very little paint. Do you call them cotton buds here? Cotton swabs, maybe. Like the tiny sticks that you're not meant to use to clean your ears, but everyone does anyway. <laughs> and that takes a really, 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 really long time to do. We had a three-day installation period, and we ended up getting at seven every morning, going to the locations, trying, d doing things until it got dark, continuing to do it with torches, uh, including at Shotton Community Centre, where people burn down picnic tables. And uh, in order to get it all done, one morning it rained, but well, one evening it rained, and the next morning the ground was still wet, and we spent 45 minutes trying to dry out the ground before realising that's not possible and having to <laughs> <laughs> resort to using some walls. There's nothing to make you wish you'd written shorter sentences more than trying to, yeah, <laughs> eight o'clock at night, going, this, I could definitely have left fewer semicolons, Holly, fewer semicolons. And just briefly, hotel rooms, some of the problems with that. 
got access to it half a day in advance. And it's a game where you go in and there's little stories about people who've been in there before and little games that you can play. And it all happens over photos of the space that you're in. So you had half a day to take those photos and put them on the back of the thing and make sure that all of the tasks that you're given made sense. Ended up finishing it up while the first groups of players were in there, like running in and uploading a new version of the game every time and then resetting the room and running out again. Um, first few times people went in, they thought it was a room escape game because it turns out room escape games are huge in Poland and if you put people in a room anywhere near the word game, they'll assume that that's what it was. So I had to put this in it just so people wouldn't think it was a room escape game. The first few people got quite a long way through solving puzzles that weren't in there. <laughs> And then people started wanting to go in two at a time, which is fine because people naturally want to do that. Um, but, and when there are eight people in a queue and it's a 20-minute game, it's hard to tell them no. But again, it wasn't written for that, so you had to frantically rewrite it and, and put, run in and go, OK, it works for two people now. Um, after you've been in there for a while, it invites you to do what you want to do with this context, this kind of private browser session of a room. And so people started doing things. And remember before when I was talking about things getting a bit out of hand in this kind of game sometimes. Um, some of it was really lovely. People made a balloon flower. The people who were running it for me at this point told me they didn't have the balloon flower going in, so they'd had balloons and they'd made it. Um, someone cleaned their ears. I don't know where they got the cotton swabs from. Uh, this was before Games of Places, so I definitely hadn't left them there accidentally. <laughs> Everyone stole the soap. I get, kept getting plaintive phone calls from the people who were running it over the weekend going, I need more soap. We'd run out of the soap that the hotel had given us and just going to supermarkets and getting more. <laughs> One person scrawled a threat of murder on a door in lipstick and left lipstick-stained toilet paper running throughout it. One person got out of the game and played some of the music that was used in the game. Um, it was a mashup of Party in the USA and um, Party and Bullshit, really, really loud. And one couple went in and didn't come out for 20 minutes and then didn't come out after half an hour. And after another five minutes, I went and knocked on the door and he opened the door entirely naked and said, yes, can I help you, while his presumably girlfriend stood behind him and took photos of his bum and my surprised face, trying not to look surprised. <laughs> so all of these problems come up again and again and have to be resolved on an individual basis for each game. But obviously this is also what I love about this kind of thing, right? P people playing too hard is a really gratifying problem to have, and it's something that is much easier to get to with this sort of game than with any other sorts. Um, the difficulties make things better, right? The way that we had to switch to paint and then that enabled us to do more things with the game. I got an email from Shotton Community Centre today saying, hey, we really like the games, can we leave them there? And yeah, that's lovely. Um, and there are these disadvantages. And for example, generally, these kinds of games don't get reviewed, which is a problem for the field because it makes it harder for us to improve. But occasionally, when you do, it's in graffiti. You probably can't make this out, but this is something that someone scrawled over one of the games on the Apollo Pavilion. It says, finished, shit game. <laughs> makes me very, very happy. Thank you. Holly, thank you so much. Wow. Let's give it up. We're, we're, we're not done with you yet, Holly. <laughs> but I just, first I want to thank you. You know, this is what's so amazing about practice is that the, when we say that we're game designers, we're making games, we're playing games, understanding games, what we mean by games is so diverse, right? So it's, it's like we happen to have, it's like we're all zoologists. And we all have these weird specialties. So now we have this one expert who, like none of us in the room, has spent her entire career sort of diving deep way under the ocean to, to explore these kind of strange, weird creatures that, that only live there, and then return to tell the tale, right? And, and once she starts talking about them, we see all the connections between what she's studying and, and everything that, that, that we're doing. And it's just so, so beautiful to hear you share your, your knowledge with us, the, the historical knowledge. I mean, the ball game, how mind-blowing is that? How many people weren't thinking like, how can we do that online? How can we do that with GPS? How can we get a whole, it's so simple and so complicated at the same time, or all of the amazing complexities that you brought out out of rule breaking in games, right? Like the, the fact that you have to tell people um, 
uh, that you'll kick them out of the game if they break a safety rule. But with cheating, you can't give them a violation because then they'll see it as an implicit challenge to to cheat in a way that's not detected, right? So all of these amazing, interesting conceptual complexities. So, so, so thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna uh, open it up to questions, but I have one question for Holly first. And before I ask you this question, I wanna remind us all about um, what practice is about. And practice is about intense, hard-hitting dialogue questions. So we're gonna have uh, great talks and sometimes very compressed times for, for Q&A. There's lots of opportunities to talk where we have these lunch discussion sessions and, and big breaks between, between sessions Saturday and Sunday for you. But please feel free to be critical, right? To, we, show, we show criticism respectfully as a form of respect as designers. Right? So, so that's our way to, to, if you have hard questions for Holly, ask them. If you have criticisms for her talk, we want to hear them, right? We're here to have a dialogue, productive dialogue. Productive conflict is what games are, maybe from one point of view. So, um, so let me ask you a question, and then we'll open it up. Everyone's gonna, expecting me to do a really tough question now, but don't worry, it's not. Um, so I, what was so interesting is that at the beginning of your talk, you presented these, these, types, these three types of games. I think there were scavenger hunts, blindfold games, and, uh, and, and photo scavenger mm -hmm. hunts. Um, so, or, uh, so my question is, we, sometimes you were delighted by examples mm -hmm. of these games. Other times you seem uh, sort of critical and annoyed that they come up so often. So what was your message in, in talking to us about these game forms? Was it more that you are, uh, you wish that people would kind of move on and not keep on reinventing the wheel? Are you interested in these as traditional forms and you'd like people to, to investigate them deeper? Uh, I think I want to talk about them partly just to... I would like people to be more aware of them as as basically genres, but mm. I think like any genre, there can be amazing things done within it. But I think if people... If we could formulate the habits that people have in designing this kind of game more clearly, and then people coming to it new would be able to understand what's already been done in a in a more... Like, more fluidly and be able to do their own version of a thing, right? Rather than just do another recreation of something that's been done before. Well, Yusha, how, how are we gonna get this knowledge out? How are we gonna sort of, where's the place where people go to do like, don't do these five games that everybody does when they, the first thing they think of when they're trying to do a, an outdoor play game? Lots of the open calls for festivals over the last couple of years have started doing this actually, oh. which I find very refreshing. Don't the, submit a Don't submit this, yes. don't submit that, don't mm. do the other thing, don't do this unless you're doing something really interesting with it. Um, I think one of, one of, I think it was Play Public had a call which had something like no whimsical hugging as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions for Holly in the audience? Uh, anyone have, uh, want to ask her? Yeah. I think it's definitely an important part of it. The amounts of money were potentially life-changing for some of the people who played, or at least, you know, this month changing, but not for most of the people who ch played. I think, in a way, they also functioned as an excuse. People feel weird about playing games in public spaces sometimes, and they feel like they need a reason to do it. And I'm trying to win five pounds is... Uh, fairly understandable reason so a bit of both I don't particularly think we should use more money prizes for it like you don't get other cultural forms going shall, shall we give one person who comes to the theatre 500 pounds I, I don't see why we should do it either what's that they should be us. <laughs> other questions yeah Everyone hear the question? Sort of. Do we need a mic for the stream, or are we okay? We'll repeat it. 
Yeah, repeat what, it. Repeat the question. So, so I'll try and paraphrase. The question was in uh, doing some research about parlor games. Um, it, what's, when are people trying to hide the presence of a game as a game in order to make people more comfortable? A little bit what you said about money and playing in public spaces. Your examples seem to really emphasize the gaminess, but it seems historically there's a lot of games where they were trying to bury that aspect of, of uh, it being overtly a game. I haven't really encountered that in anything prior to the 20th century. All of the Victorian stuff I've come across has been very upfront about it being games. I have mostly read stuff based in sort of the European traditions. I don't know if it was different in America. And definitely there's a lot of stuff for kids from the late 19th century and the early 20th century, which is games, but which they've found a way to present as being edifying. But in terms of parlor games, it mostly seems to be quite upfront about it. It's sort of from 1900 onwards, and particularly from 1950 onwards, that you start getting, oh, games, no, no games. Games are bad, right? All right, another question. We have our mic runners now. So, mic runner, uh, what, do, do I see any hands right here? Mic runner, this side. Uh, or, yeah, there we go. Sorry, you lost. Hello? Points, this uh, mic runner. All right, um, I just had a question about some of, I guess maybe two of the games used technology in a way, and mm -hmm. just in a very basic way, how much was, w would you consider technology to be a help or a hindrance in this kind of wider group of pervasive games? Oh, I think it's super, super helpful. The bits where you know local multiplayer games and pervasive games are beginning to converge is really, really interesting. I think it's great. I not even good enough at programming to be a terrible programmer or I would be doing more of this myself. I think there's lots of stuff that's going to become possible over the next few years that hasn't been previously. Uh, uh, another question? Uh, oh, right down here in front. Mike Runner. <laughs> so I have a question about the location of the games. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the games and festivals are in really comfortable situations where you're in a park or in a public mall, mm -hmm. but some of the games run into like the water mill <laughs> or like the other side of town. So what's your opinion on like these sorts of games sort of like highlighting? I know there's like maybe not just in America, but like worldwide where there might be an area that a group might want to highlight. Like what's your limit in terms of pushing in terms of location, like and scouting that? Um. If it's an interesting sort of commission, I haven't yet encountered something where I'd turn it down because of location, but I think you want to be sure if you're putting a game in a place that it's something that some of the people who habitually use that space will enjoy and want to join in on. You want to be sure that it's not a thing where you put it down and then people from three suburbs over rush and do that and then complain that there's no good coffee and go back. So I think it's a matter of thinking about what, where the people in the area hang out, what they do when they're doing it, and talking to them about what sorts of things they enjoy and what they might like. So a couple of the places that we did work in in East Durham, there were groups of teenagers around who I was basically convinced would hold the entire project in contempt. Like they were, they, they were sort of very cool 14-year-olds sitting around and, you know, practising the practicing pop songs and asking everyone for not pop songs you know whatever cool 14 year olds like and smoking and swearing really really loudly in a we definitely swear we're very grown up kind of way and then as soon as we started trying things out they genuinely came and asked what we were doing and offered to help try things out and told us again about games that they played and some of the games they played were kind of awful there was one game they played that was about throwing eggs at a man's house and trying not to be seen they assured me that he was into this game but i'm not entirely <laughs> sure that he was but they tried things out and made suggestions for changes and so on and so we felt comfortable that the games we were proposing were things that the people who were using the place would like. I think that's the important bit. Uh, maybe one or two more. I see a hand over here on the end. Uh, uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, speaking of unruly teenagers, uh, I, I was interested when you were talking about me you know burning down metal tables and so forth, and it seemed like that was perhaps the most popular game around town was uh, sort of uh, defacing or, or destroying uh, council property. 
uh, and I guess I, uh, why do you think that is, and uh, what, what lessons can you take from the popularity of, of that as a designer? Huh. I mean, fire's very satisfying, right? <laughs> Who doesn't like setting a thing on fire? If you feel like um, the disadvantages of setting a thing on fire aren't, aren't huge, then why wouldn't you? <laughs> and I guess these are mostly teenagers who don't have that much plan. They feel like there's not, you know, if they get caught setting a thing on fire, they don't feel like they're going to lose too much from that. They don't feel like getting in trouble with the council or being told off by the police is going to be a terrible thing for them. So, you know, why not? And I guess the lesson from that is mainly... I don't know, don't have flammable things in games? I hadn't thought this through properly. Or, or the lesson could be arson is a great core mechanic. Yeah. Right? Like, um, more games with fireworks? <laughs> um, I think we want to, I think we're going to uh, wrap up the Q&A because uh, out there in the lobby, we started a little bit late, so, so mm -hmm. we're on time in terms of the length of your talk, but you, in addition to uh, the refreshments uh, that we have for everyone, You've also planned, uh, you've also curated a sort of a, um, a Ludelier uh, game for us, right? Yeah, um, I brought along a game called, actually I suggested, I suggested several games and got told that the one that was the best fit was the one that involved yelling insults at each other. Uh, this is a game called Taunt that um, we designed back when I was at Hide and Seek for a project about the Normans and Anglo-Saxons. And it's a very serious game that teaches you about etymology. <laughs> Oh, and, and you're going to be, is, is there anything else you want to tell us about it, or you're going to be explaining it out in the... Yeah, I'll, I'll look, it's only for, it's for sort of 16-ish people at a time, so I'll run it a few times during the night. So come, come find yeah. Holly as she's gathering a crowd. Yeah, w yep, and I'll run it and explain the rules as we go. All right, let's thank Holly Gramazio one more time for an amazing talk. Thank you so much, Holly.